Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity to worship you, to dive deep into your word, to let you speak into our lives, into our world, into our situation, and into our future. We're listening with open hearts. Amen. We have been going through an exciting journey uh, called Elijah Church. This sermon series, Elijah Church, One Prophet's Life Relived Through God's Final Movement. We've been looking at the life of Elijah in the Old Testament and seeing how so many aspects of his life, so many experiences are prophetically repeated in God's last day's movement. So what I'm going to do is just take a very, very brief moment before we begin to recap our series. This is the final presentation in our Elijah Church series. Next Sabbath, we have something really exciting. Many of you have been watching Hope Awakens with John Bradshaw at 7 p.m. on Friday, Saturday, Tuesday, Wednesday evenings. Phenomenal, inspiring, meaningful, clear, concise presentations at hopeawakens.com. Somebody can put that in the thread as well, hopeawakens.com. And, uh, and so many of you have been blessed by that. Well, we are excited that we are going to be bringing that to you on Sabbath morning for the next three Sabbaths following today. And so, uh, so for May 2, 9, and 16, we're going to be streaming that as part of our worship service. So we're going to start our Sabbath school discussion panel at 945, and then at 1040, we're going to have some singing and a puppet show and, uh, and just a chance to connect locally as a church family. Then we're going to stream at 11 to 12, we're going to stream the, uh, the Hope Awakens presentation. So we are looking forward to that. We hope you'll join with us. Um, next Sabbath as well in that journey. So this is wrapping up our Elijah Church series. This is the eighth topic, and so the first week, Elijah Church 1, we saw that there are three Elijahs in Scripture, and that there's the Elijah the prophet, and then John the Baptist was the second Elijah who prepared the way for Jesus' first coming, and that Jesus has a, an Elijah Church a final movement of people in the last days who will prepare the way for Jesus' second coming, who will, who will reclaim love in the last days and call the hearts of the fathers back to their children, the hearts of the children back to their fathers from Malachi chapter 4. Then Elijah church number 2, we saw that uh, it was called persecuted by the false trinity. And we saw how Elijah steps into the scene of persecution. There, has been, there is a false church, Jezebel power, that has brought false relig a false religious system in and has united with the power of the state, Ahab, to enforce false worship. And then Jezebel had the prophets of Baal who were there to lead everyone everywhere astray in the ways of the Jezebel church. So we see a false trinity has united together and they unite to persecute Elijah, the true prophet of God, and we see in the last days, Revelation 13 predicts the same thing happening, how a false trinity, a false religious church system that bears the name of Christ, but not the character and the truth of Christ, will unite with the power of the state to in false worship, and that will send out the false prophet, that Revelation calls him, or, or perhaps daughters, or Protestant, uh, Protestantism that will lead people back to the mother church headquartered in Rome uh, to await to guide them away from the true teachings of the Bible, such as the, the Bible Sabbath on the seventh day, the holy day with us and God, or the, the truth about what happens when we die, and how Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and it's not that we have it in and of ourselves. Elijah Church number three was called In the Wilderness, and we saw how God has ways of providing us that we know nothing about. Elijah, because the persecution, is driven into the wilderness for three and a half literal years. And, uh, and we see how Revelation predicts in the last days, or throughout history rather, that for three and a half prophetic years, time, times, and half a time, 42 months, 1260 days, all the same prophecy in Revelation, how God's Elijah church would have to go into the wilderness, off the grid, underground, because of persecution by the false trinity, and they would be provided for by God during that time period that we saw conclude in 1798 in history and how and then it turned very practical for us that God has ways of providing for us we know nothing about God used ravens God used a widow with nothing to provide for Elijah in the same way God can provide for us 
Elijah Church number three, uh, number four was young vindicators. We saw how the widow's son died, a tragedy. It called God's character into question. And so how God is in the business of raising up young people so that they can become young vindicators of his, of his power and his love. And we saw how Elijah was involved in that process of taking ownership of the boy, of, of, of showing him that, uh, bringing him into his house, doing all these steps of stretching out over the boy, of, of being persistent, of investing a relationship with him, of all these things so that he could see God raise up this young person, of believing that God could raise him up and believing that God would do great things through this young person's life, to have a testimony to share about what God had done for him and how all of us can be involved in seeing God raise up young vindicators. Elijah Church number five, we saw rescuing hearts from Baal today. Elijah with a showdown on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. They've led everyone astray into practices of lust. Baal was worshipped through self gratification, self-stimulation through, uh, through these lustful practices that are very reminiscent today of things like modern day pornography or, or other sexual immorality that is so uh, accepted in our culture. And we, we said we're not here to shame anyone. There's so much shame, there's so much darkness when, that the devil wants to keep us from ever getting freedom, but when we come and when we accept that community and that accountability and when we put, rebuild the altar and put God first in our lives and spend time in his presence, and, and when we, um, then we can see the power of God show up in our lives in a beautiful and wonderful way to set us free and reclaim his true love in our lives, rescuing hearts from Baal today, how God can give victory even over the addictions that seem to hold us captive. Elijah Church number six, we saw that the, uh, how should the church relate to the government? We saw how Elijah really had three different ways that he related to the government during his life. React, he reacted against Ahab. Respect, he, after the showdown on Mount Carmel and the victory, he respects Ahab and uh, and and kind of guides him back to his palace through the dangerous weather, um, showing a great respect for him, and then through reservations that the government ultimately will cheat on us uh, and persecute us. So we don't want to get married to political candidates or platforms, but we want to stand up for moral issues. We want to be as compliant as possible when it doesn't call for compromise of the commands of God. And we want to also recognize where this is going so that we place our true citizenship and our true trust in heaven rather than on earth. And then finally, last Sabbath, Elijah Church number seven, help with depression. How we saw that even after all these great things that had happened, Elijah himself, the great hero of faith, the champion prophet of God, is depressed and suicidal even. And he wants his life to die. He's struggling with a deep darkness, gloom, and depression. We saw that if someone like Elijah is allowed to, st to struggle with depression, I think that you and I are too. It's, it's okay. It doesn't make you less holy to struggle with depression. It makes you human to struggle and so if Elijah can struggle, so can we. But we saw that Jesus takes the initiative, how when Elijah was down, how when he wanted to end his life, Jesus shows up on the scene. He halts the heavenly choir. He, tells, he, he gives them the silence, and he says, I got an errand to run. I'll be right back. He shows up on the scene with Elijah, 1 Kings chapter 19, and he takes the initiative. Four ways that Jesus helps us when we're depressed is, number one, he helps us refocus our physical health. That was the first step. For Elijah and for Jesus, he provides to help him get more balanced in his nutrition, in his water, in his food, in his, and all those other things. Uh, number two, to, Jesus reveals himself through his whisper. We can look for the whispers of God, silence the voices that are drowning out the whispers, and look for the whispers of God in his word, in nature, in the counsel of other people, in the providences of how he's worked in our lives. Number three, Jesus connects us with others who can help us. That's what Jesus did for Elijah. That's what he can do for us. And number four, he calls us to invest in others so we can have purpose, so we can have meaning, so we can have a legacy. And so Elijah goes from thinking that he's the only one left. God says, no, no, no. Number one, I've got 7,000 others who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Number two, I've got people I want you to be investing in, to raise up as leaders and to make a huge difference that may even have a greater difference than you did. 
Isn't that the ultimate? Isn't that the ultimate calling that God has for each one of us to be intentionally investing in a few people that can have a greater impact for God than we ever even did? That's living with purpose. And that can lift us out of just wallowing on our own struggles and investing in helping somebody else succeed, thrive, and win in Jesus' mission. So that's the, that's the summary of the Elijah Church series. It's been an exciting journey. It's almost sad to see it end. Uh, but you can check those sermons out on YouTube if you missed any of them. Uh, YouTube.com slash POSDA77. Port Orchard 7, the Adventist 77. So YouTube.com slash POSDA77. Somebody can put that in the thread as well. And, uh, and you can find those sermons there. And so let's go ahead and dive into our final topic, Radical Deliverance. Let's pray. Jesus, somebody here today needs some radical deliverance, and we invite you to show up now in their life and to remind them of how you will show up in their future as well. Amen. When was a time in your life when you needed radical deliverance? When was a time in your life when you needed radical deliverance? Some of you may have heard me tell this story before, but I remember sitting there next to the Columbia River out on a picnic on a Sabbath afternoon. We were having a great time. The kids were playing. The adults were eating and talking, and, uh, and the scene was beautiful. We were all just having a blast. It was a church picnic on Sabbath afternoon until, and I was minding my own business, hanging out with my friends, until all of a sudden, Four of the men from church thought it would be funny to grab me by the arms and legs and march me off and throw me into the river. With my clothes on, unsuspected, I did not come planning to swim that day, but they just thought it would be funny to kind of humiliate me in front of the entire church. Ha ha, right? Well, that's exactly what happens. Well, I, as a, as a 13-year-old kid or so, of course, is no match for four men and their strength. And so one of them grabs my arm, another grabs my arm, another grabs my legs. And all of a sudden, by me doing nothing to provoke it, by me doing nothing to annoy them in any way, I was just going about doing my own thing. All of a sudden, I'm being hauled off to the river to be thrown in. I was terrified. I felt, I felt uh, you know... Um, taken advantage of, right? I felt invaded. I was like, what's going on? Stop. What are you doing? And I start screaming. I start saying, I need help. I need deliverance. Will somebody come in? I'm trying to writhe. I'm trying to get free. And I can't do it. And I realize, where is this going? What's going to happen to me? I needed someone who would step in and bring some radical deliverance. Well, thankfully, as I'm screaming, crying out for help, my older brother heard the noise. Now, my older brother and I were not always best friends at that period in our life, and usually our, relation cons our relationship consisted of me on the receiving end of his fist. But he didn't like anyone else messing with his personal punching bag. And so he, uh, hear, he, he hears my cries. He, he sees the panic, the true panic on my face that this is not a joke. And I see out of the corner of my eyes, I see my brother turn around and his face just gets like blood red. And I was like, thank goodness, this guy is going to do something. And he comes running over. Now, my brother's not like a Hulk or anything like that, but he is very strong-willed. And, uh, and so he basically decided that he was going to take on all four of these guys. So he runs over, and he starts clawing and ripping their hands off of me and everything. And they're startled at how rabid this attack is by my older brother. And they find, and they, it kind of hurts them, and they kind of let go. They drop me on the ground, and bam, I'm out of there. And he runs off too. I was delivered. I was saved. I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jacob. I am free. Have you ever needed a radical deliverance in your life? Have you ever felt like something that like your situation has, you gra has grabbed a hold of, our, of your hands and of your feet and is taking you somewhere you don't want to go? 
Maybe it's our circumstances, maybe it's our poor choices, our habits, our regrets, our emotional pain, failure. Maybe it's the people we choose to associate with. Maybe it's the difficulty in a relationship, the loss of a loved one, troubles with our kids. Have you ever needed radical deliverance in your life? In this COVID-19 situation, many people are wondering where all of this is headed. There's protests going on in the street. Uh, Governor candidates are suing one another based on the decisions that they're making. People still don't know what kind of timeline to expect. People, the governor came out to say that, that certain things would be starting to open back up, but we don't know what exactly that looks like yet. And, the, and there's bigger questions still at play. Like, what will my life look like after this how will my life be different will it be safe for me to interact with people or in public again could I or someone I love contract COVID-19 will I know somebody who dies from the virus or how will I find the money to make up for the losses of no work or getting laid off will my small business ever be able to open again and the questions go on and on and on have you ever needed radical deliverance Our world is broken, and we need someone to step in and break us free. And the Bible says that's exactly what's going to happen. Open your Bibles with me to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2, if you'll open with me there. And while you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of background. We've been charting the story of Elijah, and the story of Elijah has been one has, has been one about radical deliverance. From the first time he appears on the scene in the Bible, Elijah has been under pursuit. Can you imagine what it would be like if you lived every second of your life on the nation's most wanted list? Like you couldn't take a breath in and a breath out without somebody else taking a breath in and a breath out, thinking of you, looking for you, and wanting to kill you. Can you imagine what that kind of life looked like for Elijah? And yet Elijah continues to live out the meaning of his name, my God is Yahweh. He stands up for God. He stands up for God's law. And God stands up for Elijah and delivers him time and again. Can we expect the same thing to happen for God's Elijah church in the end? You better believe it we can. Yes, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And if he was willing to deliver Elijah, the prophet in the Old Testament, he's willing to deliver his Elijah church. And so we're going to see one final act of radical deliverance that God does for Elijah. And, what, and so we can find out what will God do for his Elijah church to radically deliver them in the end. But as we come on to this 2 Kings chapter 2, we want to come and just just chart that course, Elijah has been delivered again and again. He, he, uh, he's, when, what were some of those ways? He, God provided a hiding place in the wilderness and fed Elijah by ravens during the famine. Elijah was provided a place to stay in Sidon with the widow of Zarephath and food to eat. He was delivered. Elijah was vindicated atop Mount Carmel, verse 1, verses 450 prophets of Baal, when the Lord answered by fire. Elijah was spared from Jezebel when she made a kill to vow him, a, a vow to kill him within the next 24 hours. Elijah was delivered after confronting Ahab with a message of judgment after Ahab had killed Naboth in order to have his vineyard. And then in 2 Kings chapter 1, which you can read on your own later on, when Elijah delivers a message of judgment to King Ahaziah, the king sends troops to seize Elijah and bring him into custody at the order of the king of Israel. But the king of the universe trumps the plan. He intervenes and he sends down fire from heaven and consumes the malicious soldiers, not once, but twice, to deliver Elijah. Some of us would say, that's impossible. And God says, "Uh uh-huh, but I'm not worried about that. Our God is the God of impossible. He's the God of radical. He's the God of radical deliverance. And he says, deliverance is our destiny. He gives us power that we thought we'd never have. See, does God, is God strong enough to give us radical deliverance from our difficulties? 
It, does God care enough to give us radical deliverance from our difficulties? We can look at the life of Elijah and we can count on it, that he can. That Jesus, began, that when we surrender to Jesus and choose to do life his way instead of ours, Jesus begins doing things that we thought were never possible in our life. He, be, he gives us the power to overcome temptations that we could never could before. He gives us love in our heart for hurtful people when we couldn't find it before. He provides for us in ways we know nothing about. He gives us healing and forgiveness we thought we would never have. Jesus is our radical deliverer. And his greatest act of deliverance has not even happened yet. The best is yet to come. His greatest act of deliverance is not to deliver you necessarily from the difficult situation you may have right now, but it's to deliver you from a broken world entrenched by sin. And that's what we have coming. Let's read about it in 2 Kings chapter 1. 2 Kings chapter 1. Sorry, 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. Thank you so much. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. Wh 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 wait, what? Like, what's the context here? When the, world was about, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Okay, so something happened between chapter 1 and chapter 2 that we don't even know what it was. All of the, the, the writing just assumes that we know what's going on. Oh, this is when that was going to happen. When what? Wait a second. Nobody's ever been taken up to heaven in a whirlwind before. What's going on here? There's no context. There's no lead up. Why is God going to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind? Okay, I want to know your answer. Go to the comments right now. Go to the comments on your phone, on your computer, and type, what is your answer? Why do you think, why do you think God chose to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind instead of just letting him have the same destiny that everyone else has? Letting him die and rest in the grave until the resurrection of Jesus at the second coming. Why did God change, why did God make Elijah an exception I want to know what you think. Go to the comments, write it down. There, I'm going to be checking, those, be checking back on those in just a minute. Why did God choose to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind instead of just let him die and be resurrected in the end? I want to know what you think about this. All right. And I'm going to keep reading while you do that. And we'll circle back to your comments, okay? Go ahead and type that in. So uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. I'm going to read verse 1 again and go down, and you can type in your comments why you think. This is your opinion. This is your thought on this. What do you think? When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came to Elisha and asked, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elijah replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha, Elisha, the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah, Elijah said to him, stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, face, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and the left. And the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. Now, I used to think that this means that Elisha is trying to like one-up Elijah and be like, Hey, you know, Elijah, you're cool, but I want to be twice as cool as you. No, that's not what it's saying. Keep in mind, in their, in their culture, the firstborn becomes the heir of the family, and the firstborn gets a double portion 
of all the belongings, and they're the one that carries the lineage of the family. And so when Elisha says to Elijah, hey, I want a double portion of your spirit, he's saying, I want to be your first, spiritually, your firstborn son. I want to be the heir of the same spirit that God has given to you. I want it to be upon me so I can continue to carry out this legacy of God in the world. Okay, so nothing selfish about that, but, uh, but very powerful request. Continuing on, verse 10. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, not. Ooh, could go either way. Verse 11, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this and cried out, my father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elijah saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. And then Elisha begins his own prophetic ministry in the following chapters of 2 Kings. And it becomes very clear right away that the same, that, that the, the promise that was given was granted and that the spirit of Elijah falls upon Elisha as well and he continues to carry out this ministry and does wonderful things in the land and among the nation of Israel to continue to point them to the true God. So I want to go back to your question now. Why do you think God decided to take Elijah up to heaven early instead of later on, instead of just waiting like everyone else? I'm checking out your comments here. I see him. Uh, Blenda says, as a precursor as to what will happen to us when he comes back. Excellent. Uh, Dane says, whirlwind. The universe is based on spiral mathematics. God's mind is, is a whirlwind. His spirit is like the wind. So when God comes for Elijah, his mind and spirit uh, arrive in a whirlwind form. Oh, okay, interesting. David says, because he loved Elijah so much, he couldn't wait to have him with him and, and for Elijah's protection. Excellent. Uh, Melanie says, to show us how merciful he is. Elijah forgot to trust in God for his deliverance, but God shows that he was always with him anyway. Leaves us a great example. Shows us the mercy of God. What a blessing. Excellent. And so uh, anyone else? Uh, so excellent comments there. Excellent comments. And you can keep typing your comments, what you think. Why do you think God wanted to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind early instead of just waiting for the resurrection like everyone else? Well, I want to give you uh, one reason today that I think is, uh, is powerful, and many of you have already seen this, but continuing on the same progression that we've been going on in this series, Elijah becomes a type, which is a fancy word for example, of what it will be like for God's Elijah church in the end. And so God wanted us in God. Part of the reason why God lets Elijah come up to heaven early, he basically writes a check that he couldn't verify yet. Jesus hasn't even died yet. How can he take Elijah to heaven, right? But God says, nope, my promises are sure. It's as good as it's already been done. I'm taking him up to heaven so that people later on can look at the example of Elijah and realize that deliverance is their destiny. That we can count on it as if it's a total fact. That's already been accomplished. And I want them to be able to look at Elijah and to recognize that that's going to be them someday soon. That's going to be them in the end. Jesus is our radical deliverer. You may remember the rule in Bible prophecy, uh, rule of hermeneutics or interpretation, that where what, some, what is literal and local in the Old Testament in Revelation is spiritual and worldwide. That when we miss this principle of biblical interpretation that's why you get some weird uh interpretations of revelation because they're trying to apply the same hermeneutic of looking for literal and local they're trying to look something's going to happen over in the middle east or something's going to happen over here where really god is saying these are spiritual issues that have been illustrated in the old testament that are amplified and that are going to be worldwide in the end a perfect example elijah the prophet right he's one man in one location in the Old Testament in the nation of Israel, but then in the end, God's final movement, God's Elijah church, is a large group of people worldwide, spiritual Israel, 
who are seeking to stand up for God and stand up for his law and being persecuted by the false trinity. We could keep on going, right? So we see this play out. And so Elijah is an example, what is literal and localized, Elijah going to heaven there in 2 Kings chapter 2 is going to be spiritual and global in Revelation when we have uh, with his Elijah church. This is going to be something that happens with all of us in the end. Now, in Christian circles today, the term often used to refer to when the church is caught up to heaven in the end is the, anybody know? The rapture, right? Now, rapture is a a Latin word, so it doesn't occur in the original language like uh, Greek and Hebrew, uh, but in the Latin translation of the Bible, and it it comes from a Latin word, like I said, and it literally means caught up. Now, Oftentimes when people are talking about the rapture and and when we think about the end of the world, when we think about the coming of Jesus, when we think about the Elijah church's experience in the end, what's that going to be like? What do we see happening in the story of Elijah? Well, we can see three key things that happen um, that, that kind of show us what our destiny is, what our radical deliverance is going to look like. Number one, everyone knew the Lord was coming to take Elijah to heaven soon, right? That's the reoccurring theme. We saw it right there in the chapter. Everywhere they go, they go here, they go there, they go here. And, the, and everyone says the same thing to Elisha. Hey, do you know that the Lord's going to take your master to heaven today in a whirlwind? Everyone knew that it was happening really soon. Now, how they knew that, we don't know, but evidently they ha- it had been revealed to them, whether specifically through Elijah, whether through the signs of, of the times, whether through seeing what was going on, but it was clear to them that was going to happen. The company of the prophets consistently say to Elisha, do you know the Lord's going to take, uh, gonna take, your, master to, uh, take your master from you to- today? And so, number one, what can we learn about the rapture from Elijah's story? Number one, for Elijah, the rapture was imminent, was soon. And we can, as, uh, as Elijah's, the Elijah church in the last days, as God's final movement, we can see these prophecies fulfilled. We can see the signs of the times happen. We can recognize that the, the rapture, the coming of Jesus, is imminent, is soon. We can bank on it. We know Jesus is coming soon. Now, what we're not doing is setting dates, uh, but we can see the signs being fulfilled. Elijah didn't know exactly when Elijah, Elisha didn't know exactly when Elijah would be taken. He had to pay close attention to Elijah and follow him wherever he went. In fact, it's almost like Elijah's trying to ditch him, which I don't know why, but maybe it was just a chance for Elisha to grow in faith and to keep following where God was leading, to keep following after his destiny of deliverance. Is there a lesson for us? We can recognize that Jesus' coming is imminent. It's soon. But we don't know exactly when. Because perhaps it's more important that we keep following the Lamb wherever He goes and that we don't know the exact time so that we don't just put something on our calendar and then get distracted and forget about it and pursue things that don't matter and then all of a sudden it's upon us. Right? So this is an invitation. Recognizing that it's imminent is a chance for us to redouble our focus and to actually think about what if Jesus came during my lifetime? What kind of choices would I be making? Now, I believe in in planning for your future. I believe in not being frivolous and stuff like that. It's okay to have plans, but what what would my life look like if Jesus was coming in the next year? What would my life look like if Jesus was coming in the next five years? What would my life look like if Jesus was coming in the next 10 years? We don't know when he's coming, but to live as if he is coming soon, as if he is coming in my lifetime, because it's so easy to defer that to some other time and then to permit ourselves to get distracted on stuff that is not of eternal value. What really matters right now, what really matters is walking with Jesus and sharing Jesus with others. Is there anything else that's important? Now, we can align the way that we manage our lives and our education and our financial resources and our decisions and our relationships. All those are important. But are we leveraging those toward those two directions? God, loving God, and loving others and sharing hope. For Elijah, the rapture was imminent. Number two, the second thing we can learn about the rapture from the story of Elijah is that Elijah, now, Elijah had or had not, I want you to think, had Elijah experienced any tribulation or persecution in his life before the rapture? Yes or no? Had he experienced any tribulation? 
So did the, did the rap, let me say this another way, because I want to be super clear. Did the rapture spare Elijah from tribulation? Or had Elijah already gone through tribulation before that happened? If we look at the story, Elijah's life is a story of tribulation. That's all it was. The guy has no friends. The guy spends half of his life in the wilderness, it seems like. The guy is, is constantly under attack, and yet he's still connected with Jesus. And he's still standing up for what's right. The second, uh, and so we see that, that the rapture doesn't spare us from a tribulation. But for Elijah, the rapture was after the tribulation. And that's exactly what the, the picture that the Bible teaches. The reason why we're being so clear here is because there's a very popular teaching in Christianity that says that the rapture is here to rescue the church from a tribulation so that basically we don't have to, we can get out of jail free card, right? We don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. But think about it. What does that do to our faith? If we're not if, if we're expecting to never have hardship, what does that do to our faith? Uh, it, our expectations are important in how we live our lives. Let me give you a little example, okay? A frivolous example, but you'll see what I mean. Now, when I went to seminary, uh, you had to take some tests at the beginning as part of your, your placement. If you fail those tests, you have to take extra classes that are not part of your core requirements. It just takes more time. Now, those tests were biblical languages, Greek and Hebrew, and then there was a, uh, a one on church administration, and then there was a Bible knowledge test. And so I came up, and I'm, I see Bible knowledge tests, and I'm like, I grew up as like a Bible trivia champion. I'm not trying to brag, but I love Bible trivia. And so I'm like, this is going to be a cinch for me. Like, I, I'm, this is going to be easy. I don't even have to study for this thing. I've got it. I've been studying for the last... 20 however years. And then some friends of mine came to me who had taken the test the year before uh, and they said, dude, Dustin, you got to take that Bible knowledge test like super seriously. The thing is super hard. Like really, really minuscule stuff they've got in there. You have to study it. And I'm like, whatever. I mean, how hard could it possibly be? I mean, maybe it's hard for you, but I mean, is it's going to be hard for me, you know? I'm thinking all those things. And finally, I decide, okay, 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 fine. I'll study it. And so I get this study guide, and it turns out this, I got this study guide from someone else that they'd made. It's like 30 pages long. And they're like, you should probably memorize this. And I'm like, what on earth? Anyway, I go through the thing, and it turns out that for me, I got a lower score on the Bible knowledge test than I did on the Hebrew qualifier. Okay, like which Hebrew is way harder and I'm not as good at, I feel like. And so, and so it was just like, what on earth? This test was so difficult and I probably would have failed it and would have had to take the additional classes, would have received the consequences of that had someone not come to me and said, you need to take this seriously. And because they said that, it caused me to change my priorities, to change from getting my distractions and all these other things, and to double down and focus on what really mattered so that I could make it through the test. Do you see how it applies? See, Jesus tells us that in the end there will be a tribulation. There will be, now I'm not, there will be a time of trouble. There will be a difficult, difficult situation of persecution and trouble in the end for believers. And he is very clear that he's not sparing us away from all hardship, but he's going to be with us through the hardship. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he didn't spare them from the fire, he spared them through the fire. God's going to do the same thing in the end. But it changes how we approach our lives. Because if we know that there will be a test, and we know that, hey, we should probably study for this thing, right? We should probably be diving deep into the character of God so we can trust him even when, it, even when we're not sure what's going on. We should probably be diving deep to get to know him. We should probably be building that daily relationship with him so that we can trust him even when bad things happen in our lives or when we have uncertainty we don't know what's going to happen so that we can be building up this level of trust so that when we do actually have actual difficult situations that are, are much more strenuous than having to sit on our couch for a month that we can say, hey, God's been with us all this way, and he's going to continue to be with us this whole time. The rapture doesn't spare us from the tribulation. It's after the tribulation. And that's exactly what Revelation 7, 14 says. It says, these are they, that great multitude in white, in white clothes, uh, white robes. It says, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood 
of the Lamb. Now is the time to build trust in God. We don't have to fear the future because we will never face it alone. We just need to know the one we are facing the future with. And then the third thing we can learn about the rapture from the story of Elijah is that what was the most important thing for Elisha in the story of Elijah being taken up to heaven, right? He gets asked it over and over and over again. And, and, and it's really becomes the ult, it becomes the ultimatum. Elijah says, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, I want a double portion of your spirit. And then, and then Elijah says, he says, as long as you see when I'm taken from you, then you will have it. Otherwise, not. Right? It was important for Elisha to see Jesus come and take Elijah. Elisha had been unwilling to leave Elijah's side again and again. I'm going here. No, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going here. Okay, I'm not going to leave you. Elijah was pro a promise that Elijah would, Elisha would have a double portion of his spirit if he saw him taken from him. So the third lesson we can learn is for Elijah, the rapture was visible. It was visible. You could see it happen. In fact, the whole story is hinges on whether or not Elisha would see it. If it would be some kind of a secret rapture, or if it would be a visible rapture that he could see. See, the secret about the theory of the secret rapture is that it's not a secret. Okay? So if, if the rapture was visible for Elijah, then we should expect that the rapture, when Jesus comes, is going to be visible for us too, shouldn't we? In fact, that's exactly what Revelation 1-7 says. It says, behold, he comes in the clouds, and every eye will see him come. In fact, it's even less secretive than it was for Elisha because Elijah, Elisha had to kind of pay attention to see what was going to happen. Earth's history was going to continue after Elijah was taken. Not so in the end. It will be the end of Earth's history. It will be the culmination, the climax of Earth's history. There is no next page in the book on planet Earth as we know it. And so we will not miss it. The rapture will be visible. It's not going to be some secret event that only a few people see. I was talking to a friend, uh, <clears throat> I was talking to a friend that, uh, about a week ago, and, and we were just chatting and stuff, and he was like, man, uh, when I grew up as a kid, I read the Left Behind series. The Left Behind series, Tim LaHaye, you know, sold millions of copies, and, and he's like, I, I've always shied away from Bible prophecy because I was scared to death reading that series and everything that happened in there. And, uh, and I said, yeah, I, I think, and, and so now he's kind of diving into uh, prophecy today from the Bible. And I said, yeah, I think you'll find that the Left Behind series is exactly what it claims to be, fiction. If you read on the book, the genre is fiction. And that's exactly what it is. And he said, well, I had no idea. <laughs> uh, and so I said, I think you're going to find this, the story in the Bible to be a lot more clear and a lot more full of hope than something that's sold a million copies because it's sensational and interesting. Okay? So, uh, so that's not where we want to go for Bible truth about what's going to happen in the end. We want to go to the source itself. So uh, the, three ways, the three things we can learn about the rapture, the second coming of Jesus from the story of Elijah is that the the second coming of Jesus is imminent, it's soon, is that it's after the tribulation and that it is a visible event. And so Elijah becomes a type or an example of one of the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation who are alive when Jesus comes. Mentioned in Revelation 7, Revelation 14, it says, uh, in Revelation 7, for example, it says, I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000. And then it goes through the 12 tribes, 12,000 of this, 12,000 of this, 12,000 of this. Now, when we look at, the, when we look at biblical numbers, it, it causes us to reflect and say, now wait a second, 12. Is 12 a significant biblical number? Yes, right? The 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles, the 12 is a very significant number. And so God says that 144,000, this says 12,000 each one, and they're the tribes of Israel. Remember, what is literal and local in the Old Testament in Revelation is spiritual and worldwide. Could this be talking about, instead of some literal tribes and trying to do some DNA testing and genetic whatever uh, for tribes that really don't exist anymore, could it be that this is talking about spiritual Israel? 
that this is not talking about some literal lineage, but this is talking about spiritual Israel worldwide, and that this number 12 is not as significant, that God doesn't, that it's not a literal number of 144,000, but that it's a number that it's the whole thing. It's the whole 12 tribes of Israel. It's all the people that are in them. God's not leaving anyone out from his Elijah church. He hasn't forgotten a single one, whether it appears like it, whether it seems like it, he hasn't, he hasn't left a single one who has surrendered their heart completely to him. He's not leaving out a, it's the whole complete number of the Israelites. And in fact, Revelation kind of confirms this view because so many times in Revelation there is, a, John says, I heard and then I saw. Let me give you an example. I heard a lion and then I saw a lamb. It's describing the same person, Jesus, two different aspects, okay? Same happens in Revelation 7. John says, uh, Revelation 7 verse 4, I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000. And then Revelation 7, 9 says, that I looked, I looked, I saw, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, language, and people standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It's the same group. The 144,000 and the great multitude that no one could count. It's spiritual Israel. It's God's Elijah church. It's the destiny of ultimate deliverance that God has for his Elijah church in the end. Aren't you thankful that God will deliver his Elijah church? You know, we're promised that it's not going to be easy. When we look at the life of Elijah, we can see that his life was full of tribulation. That the false trinity united to persecute Elijah. And we can expect the same thing to happen in the end. We're seeing perhaps certain things being fulfilled. We're not setting dates. We're not saying this, that, or the other. But we know what's coming. Bible prophecy predicts that in, the, in our future, there will be persecution. It will happen on many fronts, including the United States of America. We've seen how this Elijah church that we're part of today was raised up in this time period that, that, that after going underground for, for 1260 literal years, 538 to 1798, how after that time period God raises up this, this movement, this prophetic movement of people that identify what's going on in the prophecies and start rallying behind these Bible truths that are being rediscovered that were lost like the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Bible, like righteousness by faith. We're not saved by sacraments or by works, but only by Jesus Christ. By things like, uh, like that grace empowers obedience, that because we're saved, Jesus writes his law into our hearts and we begin to keep his law, not discard it. Like things, things like the, uh, that when we die, we don't go immediately to heaven or hell, but that we rest in the grave until the resurrection when Jesus comes. That God's not going to torture people in hell forever and ever, but he's going to finish the job in one shot because of his mercy and because of his justice. So as they saw, the, they saw that, oh wow, God has a plan for our health and he wants us to learn these things. As they saw these new Bible truths being rediscovered, the same truths that Jesus had given, and the first century, rediscovered after these, these centuries of darkness, they rally around as this movement. And then they organize for mission. They say, this message, summarized in the three angels' messages in Revelation 14, it needs to get out to the whole world. we got to let people know the fear of God. Uh, we got to let people know fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. It started in 1844. We need to let people know now's the time. If there was ever a good time to surrender our lives to Jesus, it's now. That the signs are being fulfilled, that the second coming of Jesus is imminent, and that it's going to come. And so they organized as a denomination uh, called the Seventh day Adventist Church, not uh, recognizing that a visible Elijah church, but there would also be 7,000 others who hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. That there would also be others out there that are faithfully following God faithfully following his law, faithfully following the Bible, and that God claims them for himself even though they may not have had the opportunity or, the, or to identify as the visible Elijah church yet. 
or at that, in their space, in their circumstance. So they organize, raised up on the heels of young, energetic passion, and they start spreading the gospel, and they take daring steps and sacrificial steps. People are selling their farms and, and giving the money to mission. People are going overseas, even before it seems like they barely have a start on North America. They're trying to get this message out. And then we find ourselves moving, fo- moving in that trajectory of history, and here we are today. God's Elijah Church, we still have the same message. We still have the same mission. And we have, in this window of time, we have the opportunity to share the mission across the globe. We live in a season of history that is still with freedom. And so God has been advancing his mission with power across the globe, and it's exciting to be a part of it. It's thrilling to devote ourselves to seeing lives changed by the power of God, just like Elijah did on Mount Carmel. And so God established religious liberty in our country for this season to position us to expand his mission across our nation and the world. He's positioned us with education, with financial resources, with influence, with spiritual gifting, as to rapidly advance his mission around the world as we sacrificially serve and share. So God calls us to live with urgency and intentionality because his coming is imminent. His coming, there will be after tribulation, the tribulation will come that we won't always be in this season and that his coming is going to be something that we can look forward to seeing in the end. We don't know exactly when when it will happen, but we see that our nation is going in the direction toward, ultimately, persecution. Prophecies will be being fulfilled. The Jezebel Church headquartered in Rome will unite with the power of the state to persecute the Elijah Church. Protestant America will link hands with them across the gulf and lead everyone everywhere away from God's law. It will become illegal to honor the central commandment of God's law. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And instead of the authority, instead the authority of the Jezebel church will be exalted by their decision to sanctify Sunday instead of God's Sabbath day. It's prophesied in Revelation that false revivals and false miracles will lead many to believe the seventh believe the Jezebel church even atheists because their worldview has set them up to define truth that way. And the whole world wondered after the beast. And the earth will ultimately become polarized into only two camps. Hasn't happened yet followers of the false trinity and the Elijah church who keeps the commandments of God and has the faith of Jesus. And the Elijah church who remains standing for the law of God will become seen as the enemy to the common good of society. They have not been willing to exchange the seal of God for the mark of the beast. They are persecuted by the false trinity. They're forced to flee into the wilderness just like Elijah was. And it is a time of trouble for the faithful people of God. Some are killed. Some are in prison. Some are hiding. But God is with them. He provides for them just like he did for Elijah in the wilderness. He gives them courage and peace and hope. And while the persecutors are closing in, it appears that they might eradicate the Elijah church completely. God will not allow the earth to be left without a witness. God intervenes. He pours out the seven last plagues to interrupt the, uh, interrupt the power of the enemies of truth. Retributive justice is served. God interrupts and diminishes their abilities to persecute the Elijah church. And his Elijah church is shielded from harm. And then in a climactic end of earth's history, Jesus shows up. The enemies of God behold in horror the glory of the Holy One they've been fighting against. The the dramatic earthquakes happen. The islands are swept away. The earth changes as we even know it. Everything goes into an uproar and people look up. And in the two camps, one camp says, cries out to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of the Lamb who sits on the throne. And the other group says, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him. Here he is. And Jesus breaks through and rips us out of that difficult situation. He rips us away from the hands of the evil one. And he says, come, you're going to be with me forever. This is radical deliverance. It will get hard on a broken planet like ours. In your life now, you may be going through difficult challenges. You may be going through things that you don't know what's even going to happen. You you don't know what the next uh, page is going to be in your story. But our God is a radical deliverer. Jesus 
says deliverance is your destiny. And the same God that delivered Elijah time and again can step in in your life and deliver you from the things that you're struggling with. He can give you a new heart so that you can go about the same circumstances in a different way. He can give you a new mind so you can go about the same challenges in a new way. And he can give you a new environment, new life around you so that you can see his power working in your life. He wants to do all those things for you. He wants to break through and be your radical deliverer. But most of all, he promises to be your radical deliverer ultimately. That someday very soon, he's going to show up. It's happening soon. It's going to happen after the tribulation. But we're all going to look up and we're going to see Jesus coming for us. And the same one that we've talked to in prayer all these years, the same one that we've listened to through scripture all these years, the same one that we've learned how to trust and that we built a relationship with, the same one that we've lived for, the same one that we've seen his sacrifice for us and chosen to sacrifice for his mission, the same one that has consumed our thoughts, that has consumed our love, that has consumed our priorities, we're going to see him show up and break through the clouds and come back and take us home. Deliverance is our destiny. Jesus is our radical deliverer. Do you want to thank Jesus for his radical deliverance today? Do you want to claim that deliverance in your life? It's simple. All you have to do is surrender to Jesus. Let him reprioritize your life however it needs to be. Trust him with, what, with the challenges and the difficulties that you're facing and claim your destiny of deliverance. If you want to thank Jesus, if you want to put your life in his hands, if you want to thank Jesus for that deliverance, I invite you to pray with me today. Jesus, thank you so much for being our radical deliverer. Thank you so much for promising to break through the skies, to interrupt human history, especially when it gets really, really bad in the end, things that we don't even know yet. We don't have to fear it. We don't have to fear our future. We only have to know the one who will face our future with, and that's you, Jesus. Thank you for being our radical deliverer. Thank you that deliverance is our destiny. And Lord, we just place every aspect of our life in your hands. Lord, if there are things in our life that shouldn't be there, God, we don't want anything to move us into the other camp. We want to follow the lamb wherever he goes. And so, Lord, if there are things in our life that we need to be surrendered to you today, we do that right now. They need to be cut out of our life. We invite you to do that. If there are things that we need victory over, Lord, we invite you to give victory, uh, to, to help us, um, to... To, give a, to help us surrender that will to you. We surrender our will to you so that you can give us a victory in those areas in our life. And Lord, that you can surround us with other people who can help us. Lord, thank you for being our radical deliverer. And we give you our hearts today. And we embrace your hope that you are coming very soon. God, we want to live every day for that day when you come. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us here as we just have unpacked uh, a beautiful message of what Jesus is doing and what he plans to do. And if you have any questions or if there's anything or if you'd like us to come alongside and, and journey with you even uh, in, in this process of giving Jesus your heart, of live, learning to trust him, of living with hope, uh, go ahead and send us a message. Port Orchard Adventist Church on Facebook. You can send us a message. You can send an email to Pastor S at posda, P-O-S-D-A dot org, uh, we, or you can give us a call. Uh, how are we can serve you um, in this journey? Because we want to do it together. We're God's Elijah Church, and we want to live for him in these last days with the hope of his soon coming. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next Saturday at 945 for Bible study discussion panel and 1040 for our worship gathering. God bless you. Take care.